Hi, my name is Tim Seckler. I am a uh, certified elder law attorney with offices uh, in Morris, Pennsylvania, which is just north of Pittsburgh, but we serve clients kind of all over Pennsylvania with these issues. Uh, I'm doing this video uh, to uh, share with you some different things that I know about doing nursing home Medicaid spend down planning. So um, the idea is here that we're trying to get information out there to let people know that there are some things you can do to protect yourselves, protect your assets, even after someone is in the nursing home. Far too many families uh, kind of freeze up when someone goes into a nursing home. They know about this nursing home five-year Medicaid look-back period. Uh, they know that there's all kinds of restrictions on what you're allowed to do, and that's true. There are a lot of rules that you need to follow here, but there are exceptions to those rules. There are nuances. Uh, there are things you can still do. There are often ways we can still protect assets even after someone is in the nursing home. Uh, and I'm gonna teach some of those things to you today. Now, a little bit of um, caveat here, a little bit of, uh, of warning is do not try this alone, okay? This stuff is complicated. Um, there are rules, there are exceptions to the rules, there are exceptions to the exceptions of the rules. I can't talk about all of it today. We would be talking for hours and hours and hours. You really need to work with someone, uh, an attorney who knows this stuff. If you have a loved one in a nursing home, if you are in a nursing home, you need an elder law attorney. Uh, a nursing home admission is a legal problem. Nursing homes, uh, on average in Pennsylvania, as I'm recording this, about $11,000 a month. <clears throat> if any other creditor in the world were coming after you for $11,000 a month, you'd probably go see a lawyer. But uh, for some reason, people sort of lock up when it comes to the nursing home planning. They're not sure if they're allowed to do anything. They, they want to keep things private. They're embarrassed or whatever it is. And I, I urge you to get the help of an attorney. Nothing I do today, you should try on your own. This is education only planning. Um, you believe me, if you try to do some of the more technical stuff I'm going to chat about, you will screw it up. You will cost your family a bunch of money. Um, I, uh, I've been doing this work for uh, just about 10 years. I, I found elder law after my grandfather spent a long time in a nursing home. My family went through a pile of money paying for that care. And you know, it, it's not the nursing home's fault. The nursing home was providing care that my grandfather needed. The problem is we have this crazy government nursing home Medicaid system that requires you to go broke in order to get somebody else to, to pay for your care. And I really am just of the opinion we shouldn't be doing it that way. You know, we have a healthcare delivery system for seniors that Medicare, which is healthcare for people over 65, pays for some healthcare issues and not for others. It will pay for uh, the care typically related to like a heart attack or cancer. But if you need the custodial type care that is associated with like Alzheimer's disease in a nursing home, Medicare is not going to pay for that. And so then we have to look at Medicaid. Um, and, you know, it, it's just, it, it seems to me that we're penalizing people. We're penalizing my grandparents. We're penalizing lots of families out there based on the accident of whatever health care issue they have rather than some, um, some criteria with any merit at all. So um, my goal in my law firm, which again serves Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania in particular, but I've done cases kind of all over, is to help families get the care they need and to the extent possible not go broke in the process, protect assets for the healthy spouse, protect assets for the kids, um, and, and whatever my client's goals are. Um, so I've got uh, some slides here I'm gonna share with you. <clears throat> And let's pop this up here. All right, very good. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some nursing home Medicaid secrets. Like most of the people know most of the rules, but it's, it's a little nuances that uh, sort of get in the way. And, and my goal here is to help you get the care you need without going broke in a process. Um, a little bit about us and my law firm, I am a veteran. I served in Afghanistan with the Air Force back in 2005 and six. Uh, my firm has grown a bit. We're now in Mars, Newcastle, and Butler. I also have a, a South Hills office we use occasionally. Uh, Education-wise, I'm a Duquesne law grad. I have an MBA from Duquesne as well. Uh, undergrad was at West Virginia in finance. Um, affiliations were associated with all kinds of elder law affiliations, National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, uh, National Elder Law Foundation, local bar, state bar associations. And I am what is called a certified elder law attorney. So if at the end of this video, uh, you think I'm a jerk for some reason, I guess you wouldn't be the first. Um, and you need help in this area, find somebody with this credential, uh, certified elder law attorney, because that's somebody now that you know just by having that designation, they are not a dabbler. This is somebody that does this full time because you have to certify you have a certain number of cases 
and sit for a really, really tricky exam. Um, so that's a little bit about me. That's a picture of me when I was probably a younger and, and more attractive man, or maybe the guy had some good lighting or something. I'm not sure. Uh, all right, here's, uh, here's what I want to chat with you about. Um, paying for long-term care, your options, self-pay, long-term care insurance, the government. Uh, when we're talking about the government, there's really three options, Medicare, the VA, and Medicaid. We're gonna chat about eligibility for programs. And then I've got a couple of uh, examples that uh, kind of surprise people that um, you're allowed to use these techniques uh, sometimes. So paying for long-term care. So this is sort of our continuation, a continuum of care, all right? So uh, it, it typically occurs that the, the issues affecting seniors, you can stay at home. Now staying at home, uh, the cost for that varies. I mean, I've met 99-year-olds who are on no pills and take care of themselves completely. I've met people in their 60s who need around-the-clock care providing them the home. So staying at home, the cost of that can vary pretty dramatically. I mean, around-the-clock nursing care in the house is $20,000 a month um, and financially unattainable for most people. The next option, independent living. This is typically like a patio home arrangement or <clears throat> an apartment building, and there's some folks around to help but it's not really a medical situation, right? So there could be a cafeteria, there could be laundry service. <coughs> you could get care provided to you by outside vendors into the independent living facility, but uh, the independent living facility itself is not licensed to provide medical care in, in that uh, building. So uh, typically a couple of grand a month, sometimes there's like buy-in fees as well. Personal care homes, 3,500 to six grand a month. Um, this is, uh, most of these types of facilities are licensed as personal care homes as Pen in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, there are also licensed assisted living facilities, but like the care that is provided in those facilities overlaps a little bit and it typically revolves around a couple of activities of daily living. So maybe you need help getting dressed, bathed, uh, food, um, medication reminders, maybe you're a wander risk because of dementia. So a lot of that type of care can be covered in a personal care home or an assisted living facility. And then uh, the next step would be skilled nursing. A nursing home, which in Pennsylvania uh, can cost um, almost $11,000 a month on average. Uh, and then there are some home and community-based care programs where Medicaid can help pay for. Um, you can get care providers to come into the house uh, a popular one is something called the LIFE program where you can go to uh, the LIFE facility uh, a couple of days a week perhaps and then they may send people to your house, they send a bus for you and it's, it's a nice program where we can get Medicaid to pay for some care but also uh, an arrangement that might just keep you in your house longer than possible so you can check those folks out. But uh, anyway, you look at this stuff, it's expensive, so how are we gonna pay? The first, the default rule if you do nothing else is you're gonna pay privately. This is what my grandparents did. They, they paid privately until they essentially went broke. And so that's, that's not really what we wanna do here. I mean, I'm gonna make the assumption um, that you or your parents, whoever you're watching this video for, did not work their entire life just to lose uh, all of their retirement savings in their house to a long-term care event. Um, and so we need to look at the other options because we don't want to go broke doing this. Um, the next is long-term care insurance. Now, long-term care insurance is an interesting idea, but not many people buy it because of the expense. And sort of from my uh, take, it's not really the expense. You know, let's say a contract could be had for a few thousand dollars a year. The problem is uh, the risk, right? If I spend a bunch of money over 20 years and I never get sick, then you know, the insurance company wins the bet. And, um, there are some different ways to, to plan with long-term care insurance where it might not get so risky, uh, but still most people don't buy it. And then when you're looking at government programs, <clears throat> there's Medicare, the VA, and Medicaid. Now, there, there could be an entirely different talk on both Medicare and the VA. Um, I'm not gonna go into depth on either of them much today. This is really a, a Medicaid eligibility talk. Um, but real quick on Medicare, you know, the problem with Medicare is that Medicare pays for acute care, not long-term care, all right? So, so if I, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in my office, a gentleman walked in, let's call him Mr. Smith walks in, and he has a heart attack, right? I or my team would end up getting on the phone, 911, get him to the hospital where they can stabilize him. Um, the, you know, they might need to do open heart surgery, they might need to do, you know, pacemaker and, and all of the magic that the healthcare professionals do. If he's over 65 and on Medicare, Medicare is going to pay for most of that. Yeah, there's going to be co-insurance and co-pays and all the rest, but Medicare is doing the heavy lifting, and that could be three, four hundred thousand dollars in medical care. Medicare is going to pay for that. But if instead, if the gentleman walked through the door and had a stroke, now uh, we call 911, we'd get him to the hospital. Let's say they're going to stabilize him, and then three days later, 
they want to discharge him to a skilled nursing facility. <coughs> Excuse me. They want to discharge him to a skilled nursing facility where he's going to live the rest of his life. Let's say it was a really bad stroke, so he's going to stay in the nursing home. His life expectancy at that point might be, say, like three years. Well, <coughs> That's also three, four hundred thousand dollars in medical care, but Medicare is not paying for that. Medicare pays for twenty days, maybe up to a hundred days, depending on how it's going with some copays. After which, you're on your own at an average of about three hundred fifty dollars a day. And you know, you look at it and you think, why are we doing this? Why, why does a fellow that has the heart attack fare better financially than the fellow that has a stroke? Like, I don't know what I'm going to have. If you look at what the the numbers that say like the Alzheimer's Association is putting out. One of their statistics is one in three seniors is going to die with dementia. One in three. It's not. It's not this this tiny tiny minority of people. A lot of us are going to deal with this. Uh, and if I'm on the the dementia train, I can't get off. You know, I had a uh, I had a physical not too long ago, and I told the doctor I said several of my grandparents had dementia, and the guy tells me to uh, to do crossword puzzles, keep my mind active. And I thought, boy, you know. <laughs> Not much of a uh, not much of a wellness plan here. Um, so, but if I can't prevent it, and hopefully, you know, that the, the scientists and the doctors that are out there working on this thing will give us all ways to prevent dementia. But if I can, then at least I can understand how it's going to impact my family financially. At least I can make sure that if I get sick, my my wife's okay. Uh, and I think it's sort of incumbent on us to understand how these rules work and how we can protect assets. Um, from from this harsh government rule book. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, Medicaid is known as medical assistance. So medical assistance for long-term care. Now these rules are crazy. Uh, nobody sat through uh, and like tried to come up with the best long-term care planning solution and the best rules to, to make that work, right? Medicaid is this sort of conglomerate of all these laws and regulations that have been kind of meshed together and formed in part by case law and so it's, it's just crazy. And these quotes came from a judge out of the federal district court. This is a federal judge. He called, he or she, I'm not sure, called Medicaid uh, one of the most completely impenetrable texts within human experience, dense reading of the most torturous kind, and an aggravated assault on the English language, right? Judges don't write like this. This is, this is somebody that's kind of making a point. And what they're saying is, look, I'm a federal judge. I'm supposed to be a pretty smart person. I don't understand this Medicaid law. How is a 90-year-old with dementia going to understand if they're eligibility for, eligible for Medicaid? And, you know, the, the rules are crazy. Um, so here's sort of my take on how to understand it. I want you to first uh, get a couple of concepts straight. First, we need to understand in any given scenario, are we talking about a single person or are we talking about a married person? Okay, because Medicaid treats single people and married people differently. Uh, and then also within that, are we talking about assets or are we talking about income? So we've got to keep single people and married people and assets and income straight. Um, and so here's, here's sort of the basics of the deal. Single person here uh, in Pennsylvania, a single person who goes into the nursing home is going to be allowed to keep either $2,400 or $8,000 depending on their income. So if they're in, and there's the income cap. So if their income is above $2,349 a month, they're only allowed to keep $2,400 in assets. If their income is below $2,349 a month, they're allowed to keep $8,000 of assets. Now, that income cap changes every year, but either way, if you're allowed to keep $2,400 or if you're allowed to keep $8,000 and you were in a nursing home, we can probably agree that's not much money, right? And so, and then, so this begs the question though, what are the available resources? And it's pretty much everything you own, right? Everything counts except a couple of a couple of nuances. You're allowed to keep your primary residence. They don't count that. However, there's some caveats to that. So you're allowed to keep your primary re uh, residence. You're allowed to keep a car. You can keep small life insurance contracts, the stuff in your house. Um, but then there's other stuff, and then there's a couple of other things. Now, IRAs are generally available resources, uh, but not in Pennsylvania currently. As I'm recording this, they don't count the healthy spouse's IRA, but back, you know, we began this by talking about a single person. If you are a single person, or if you're married and um, you are the spouse in the nursing home, they count your IRA. If you are married and, and you are the spouse that's healthy, they don't count your IRA, but that's the only IRA that's safe. All the other IRAs, if you're the person in the nursing home, 
your IRA is available for care, retirement account generally, IRA, 401k, 403b, Roths, they're all available. And then you can have a burial account. So uh, <clears throat> um, there's a county by county uh, value that you're allowed to have in your burial reserve. So those are sort of like just some little nuanced things, but pretty much everything counts. And if everything else has to be below $8,000, um, then you're asset eligible for Medicaid. But then you have to look at the income because if I'm, if I'm a single person, I'm in a nursing home. Now I have my house and I have my car and I've got eight grand. Uh, but all of my monthly income has to go to the nursing home. So all your income goes to the nursing home with the exception of $45 a month. Uh, and all of their generosity, they allow you to keep $45 a month for all of your personal needs, which in my experience usually goes for uh, the, the haircuts or soda machine. Right? So the, the 45 bucks is gone, you know, and, and so now I'm down to several thousand dollars in total net worth, but I've got my house and my car, but wait a minute, who is paying the, uh, who's paying the property taxes? Who's paying the utilities on that house? Who's paying the car insurance? Who's putting gas in the car? Who's driving the car? Why do I need a car? I'm in a nursing home for the rest of my life. And, and so then what happens is the eight grand or whatever you were allowed to keep goes away because you're spending it on this stuff. And then you realize you're out of money. So then what happens is somebody wants to sell this house and this car, right? Usually uh, the adult children would come with their power of attorney document to an attorney and they say, well, look, dad's in the nursing home. He's on Medicaid, but, but we're out of cash. We want to sell his house. And if they sell his house, now what does dad have? Well, he's got the cash. He owned the house. He sell the house. He's got cash sales proceeds. So let's say he uh, sells the house for $150,000. He now has got 150 grand. That's more than $8,000. He's not allowed to have it. So now um, he loses Medicaid eligibility until he spends all that money down to $8,000. Right. So if you sell your primary residence and end up with cash, you will lose Medicaid eligibility until you spend all that money, um, which is not the result we're looking for. Right. Uh, the other thing that could happen is the kids will say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Um, I've read dad's will. Dad's will says that when he passes away, I get the house. So you know what? I'll pay his property taxes. I'll pay his utilities. Because when he passes away, I'm going to inherit his house. I'll sell his house. I'll make a bunch of money. I'll pay myself back for all the property taxes and stuff that we've, that we've lost in the interim, uh, which, is, which makes sense that you would come to those conclusions, except, and I think I have a slide on this later, but Pennsylvania has what's called the estate recovery program, where the state of Pennsylvania has the ability to recover against your estate for the dollars they've spent on your nursing home. So if you are on Medicaid and have your house and then you go through and you end up passing away and let's say the state of Pennsylvania has a $200,000 estate recovery claim and your house is worth $150,000, the state is going to force the executor of your will to sell the house to pay back the state of Pennsylvania for their estate recovery claim. Uh, and so then the, the state ends up getting the sales proceeds of the house rather than your family. So the, the lesson here is that a single person who is in the nursing home if they're in there long enough, is going to go to zero. They're going to go flat broke because they had the audacity to have a, a stroke rather than a heart attack, right? And it's just, in my opinion, not the way we should be, uh, we should be doing this. Um, let's do a married case here. So a married applicant goes to the nursing home and the single person, um, the, let's say the husband is the person that goes into the nursing home. Well, so what they do, with the exception of the healthy spouse's IRA, they add up all of the other assets and they, you know, they come up with this total of the available resources. And then the healthy spouse is allowed to keep half of that number up to a maximum of $128,640. That's this figure today. That number changes annually. <clears throat> so if you're watching this sometime after I recorded it and just make sure you got the right number. Um, but, so you're allowed to keep half. So an example could be if single per, if, a, if the husband goes in the nursing home and the family has $200,000 of available resources, the spouse, the healthy spouse, is going to be allowed to keep the house and they're going to be allowed to keep 100,000, half of the total. The other 100,000 needs to be, it comes over like the dad's category and let's say dad's allowed to keep 2,400 or 8,000 um, bucks. So we're about to spend 90, a couple grand on the nursing home before we're asset eligible for Medicaid. 
Okay, so um, half of the assets are for the healthy spouse. But if that family had, say, more money, um, $400,000 rather than $100,000, now we don't get to keep half of the money. The half the healthy spouse is allowed to keep is capped at this $128,000 figure. So uh, you're allowed to keep half up to a maximum of $128,000. Now that $128,000 to me is ridiculous because they don't take into account the person's age, their life expectancy, their their resources, their uh, well, but their income. They don't take any of that into account at the first level. You have to, uh, <clears throat> and they don't care. So. Uh, a 67-year-old whose husband goes into the nursing home is allowed to keep 128,000, and a 97-year-old whose husband goes into the nursing home is allowed to keep 128,000. Well, how the how the heck is the 67-year-old going to live for the next 30 years uh, on this amount of money? If um, you know, so the, the, these rules are just they're just harsh. And then we have to take a look at the income. So the healthy spouse's income is safe. <coughs> so if mom who's the healthy spouse on the community has her own social security and pension check. She's allowed to keep that, but, um, and she may be allowed to keep some of dad's income depending on her expenses and how the math works out. So the state has this formula and they plug in her income and his income and their medical bills, their me uh, medical insurance bill and, and a couple of other medical expenses and then plug it in the formula. And they say, well, she may get to keep some of his income, but typically or commonly not all of it. Right? So, uh, you, you end up with a situation where we've taken a whole bunch of their assets. She's allowed to keep her income, but then some of the, the sick spouse's income has to go to the nursing home every month. But here's the challenge. Dad's now in the nursing home. We've got less income, but, but the expenses don't go down. The property taxes don't go down because dad's in the nursing home. The utilities don't go down because dad's in the nursing home. The only thing we're not buying right now is dad's food, right? Everything else, all the other monthly bills are the same. And so <clears throat> the income is insufficient to handle that because we're losing some of dad's income. So the money that she was allowed to keep, the um, remember the half up to $128,000, this half she's allowed to keep starts coming smaller and smaller and smaller, right? They're spending through this money. Uh, and then, and then she'll then unfortunately have to like sell her house or, or move in with her daughter or whatever else. And she sells the house and Pennsylvania even wants a bunch of that money. And it's just, these, these rules are, are real difficult for families to get through. It's hard to comprehend why we have such harsh rules, but it, it, it's even more difficult for families to navigate themselves through these rules when, when they are dealing with all the other stresses involved with uh, long-term care. And so um, what I've got is a, a couple of different things we gotta go through, right? So now, like I just went through Medicaid eligibility in a decent level of detail, um, and people don't know that level of detail, but people do know that, hey, if I go into the nursing home, I had better be broke ahead of time because they're gonna take all my stuff if I end up there, right? And so what people start looking to do is make asset transfers. They wanna make gifts of the assets to other people. So by the time they end up going in for care, they are broke. Um, and so there's a couple of different types of transfers. So first, there are several exempt transfers. So you can transfer assets between spouses without a problem. Um, if you have disabled kids, you can transfer assets to disabled kids or to a trust for the benefit of a disabled kids, and that won't impact your eligibility. You gotta do it correctly. Again, on, on any of this, you need to consult with an attorney. But there are some exemptions. Um, they, don't, uh, trans, uh, they don't hit you for transfers resulting from a death. So, um, and then if uh, there's this caregiver exemption for the transfer of uh, the primary residence to a kid that has lived in the house and been providing care. So there's, and there's nuances to all of this, but there are some times where we can transfer assets to certain people without a problem. In your case, your situation needs to be evaluated to see if any of these apply. Um, one of the things that we will commonly do, and again, don't go out and do this on your own, is if dad goes into the nursing home, we will often transfer assets to mom's name. Um, the assets that they are allowed to have, and then we'll rewrite her will uh, to, to essentially disinherit dad, right? So dad's in the nursing home, mom's healthy in the community, they're allowed to keep this 128,000. Uh, if we leave that in a joint account and mom dies first, then all of that money ends up with dad, and now I got a single person in a nursing home, we're gonna lose all the money. 
there is an opportunity if mom dies first. It's funny to call this an opportunity, I guess. But if mom dies first, she could have redone her will to leave assets to the kids and thereby protecting some money. Now, there's even caveats that dad has to elect against and, and may be able to get some of that money anyhow. But you can protect assets. And so what we did there was we made an exempt transfer to a spouse, no problem. And then if mom dies first, we made a transfer resulting from a death. Again, no problem, right? And so understanding how these nuances work is where, is where the opportunity lies. Um, and then there are transfers for value. So if you give asset, like if you sell something, you give it away for value. I have a $100,000 home. I sell it for $100,000. Medicaid doesn't penalize you for that because you got fair market value for it. Now you have a hundred grand. You didn't protect anything, but there's no transfers there. And then Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania, to my knowledge, is the only state that really does this. Um, but Pennsylvania will allow you to make exempt transfers. They don't ask you about gifts in any given month up to $500. So uh, now it's $500 total, not $500 per recipient. So in theory, then what somebody could do, again, don't do any of this on your own, but somebody could make a $500 transfer to their kid every month um, and uh, over 12 months protect $6,000 and Medicaid does, uh, you know, doesn't ask about transfers for $500 or less. Now, I'm always concerned about some, some caseworker that um, is a little too uh, detailed, so I don't do $500. We do it at like $495 because there's this question about $500 or $500 or less, right? Um, so anyway, here, here's some transfer issues. Now, if we don't have one of these, if we don't have an exempt or, or something that's not a problem, then you get into this five-year look-back period where transfers will result in a problem. And so five years, 60-month look-back period. What this means is that if you give away stuff, a house or money, um, and if you need to apply for Medicaid in the next five years, Medicaid is going to ask about it. So on the application, it asks, have you given any assets away in the last 60 months greater than $500? <coughs> and let's say the answer to that is yes, right? So um, if I've given away a house worth 100,000 bucks and I need to apply for Medicaid in the next five years, what Medicaid does when we file the application, we disclose the gift. Uh, and you have to disclose the gift. They get five years of statements anyhow. So you have a $100,000 transfer, and what Medicaid does is they divide that by the average monthly cost of care in Pennsylvania, which is just shy of 11 grand, okay? So if you had $100,000 divided by, let's call it $10,000, then the answer is 10, 10 months. For the next 10 months, Medicaid is not going to pay the nursing home because you gave away money. That's called a penalty period. Okay, so the five-year period is, a, is the reporting period. If you've given assets away in the last five years, you have to report it. And if there are penalizable transfers, then you will catch a penalty period, the length of which is determined by the value of the asset you gave away. Okay, so take whatever the value of the asset is, divide it by about uh, 11 grand, and then that's going to give you a number of months for during which Medicaid's not gonna pay for care. Now we're in a real bad problem. This is the problem that we need to avoid because now we're in a situation where the nursing home's not being paid. Dad doesn't have any money, Medicaid's denied eligibility for 10 months because there's an asset transfer and they've got an unpaid bill, which you know, sort of in this thing, the worst day is the first day the nursing home isn't going to get paid. I mean, part of our job, elder law attorneys generally is, yes, I wanna help you protect assets, but I also don't want to get us in a situation where we have severe creditor issues because we've resulted in this period of ineligibility. So most of our plans are going to result in one fashion or another. The nursing home is going to get paid because otherwise you risk getting kicked out or you risk having to go to the hospital and not being welcome back and all kind of stuff. Um, so um, by gifting, gifting is risky stuff. Now there's another video that I've already done and we're happy to get it to you if you reach out to us on uh, ways to plan ahead and put together five-year plans and, and all that. That's not today's topic. Today's topic is really more about what happens uh, when you have a loved one or if you are in a nursing home. Uh, we talked about a state recovery. This is that program by which if you're a Medicaid recipient, you pass away and you have assets in your probate estate, uh, the Pennsylvania will uh, Pennsylvania will have a claim against your state and they'll come over. And this is the real problem with the house, right? They don't count the house from an eligibility standpoint. 
but there's a real risk in losing the house when you pass away because the state has a claim against, uh, against your estate. Uh, so let's talk about crisis planning. <coughs> so the idea here is um, we call this a crisis planning uh, when, you know, if families are, are facing a $10,000 a month um, nursing home bill, for most families, that's a, that's a financial crisis. Now, this is sort of a three-pronged test. First is medically qualified. So doctor has to fill out a form saying that, that you need the skilled nursing and then area agency on aging. Well, area agency on aging does their own assessment to make sure that you are functionally eligible for Medicaid. So I'm going to assume that that prong is checked off. That there's no question as to our Medicaid eligibility. Then you have to determine whether you're financially qualified, which is the part we just talked about with, you know, how much money you're allowed to keep and you have to spend down to get there. Uh, and then third is you got to be able to support your eligibility. It is on you to show to Medicaid that you are eligible for Medicaid, that you have not made transfers in the last five years. So they're going to make you go out and get a stack of paper this thick. Like when we do Medicaid applications, we take real care to put it in three ring binders with dividers and all this stuff because you're submitting so much information to these overworked caseworkers. And your job, our job is to make their job as easy as it can be. We want them to be able to find the information they're looking for. We don't want them to think we're hiding anything because we're not hiding anything. But what happens is, you know, when a lot of, I think families do this on their own, they get this sort of like piecemeal information. They've got 40 cases sitting on their desk and they just lose track of what you submitted them. Um, in my experience, a lot of these Medicaid caseworkers, great people, you just need to be able to present your case to them in a way that they understand it, they get it, you answer the questions, you answer the questions timely, and you give them the information in a way that they don't lose it. Um, and, and it can really result in, in the eligibility <clears throat> coming along, coming along well. Um, all right. So now we're going to talk about some spend down techniques. I've got this sort of general list, and then we're going to go through a couple of, of sort of complicated examples. <coughs> um, so the scenario is someone is in a nursing home. And we've got too much money. We did not go in eligible, you know, we did not go in automatically eligible. So you've got some stuff. Maybe you got an IRA, maybe you got some money, maybe you got a, a hunting camp or, or whatever. This could also be what happens when you've been eligible and then that house sells. And so now dad's in the nursing home, but the kid with the power of attorney uh, sells the house and now dad gets 200 grand from the home sale proceeds. Now what do we do? Uh, and there's sort of this low hanging fruit. You know, you can buy a car in a single case. You have to question whether that makes a ton of sense because we're just going to lose it to the estate recovery claim. In a married case, if mom's out in the community and she's got a 25 year old vehicle, we might buy her a new car. She's going to probably have to buy a new car in the next couple of years anyway. Let's just do it now. Uh, you can do the funeral arrangements, personal items for mom, for dad. Um, Comfort items, there's there's no provision that says you can't have an iPad to talk to your grandkids. Uh, and then you can fix up the house particularly, like if the spouse is still living there, if the thing needs a new roof or a new furnace, maybe there's an opportunity there. So that's some things that you can do, kind of low-hanging fruit, kind of everybody knows about this. Um, now, don't just go out and do it, because sometimes they don't make any sense. And sometimes this is not the right plan. A lot of people, um, <clears throat> There are nuances where you think you're not eligible for Medicaid. The people in the nursing home billing office don't think you're eligible for Medicaid, but because of the, the income situation or whatever, you may be able to keep a little bit more money and you, you don't have to go out and buy a new car. So again, uh, even though these things can be relatively easy to do, that doesn't mean you should do them. You should go speak to somebody that, that understands this stuff. Um, all right, some more advanced stuff. So we can disinherit the sick spouse. You could consider uh, special needs trust. That's what an SNT is. So a trust for the sole benefit of a disabled kid. Um, we, we might be able to protect the assets. You, of course, to create a trust like that, you're going to need to work with a lawyer. Um, now there's a couple of things down here that, that are going to require a little bit more, uh, by way of explanation. I've got some examples that I think help explain them. Um, and maybe we should just, just hop to, into those. So, <coughs> Um, so here's an example. This is a married case. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Now, Mr. Jones is an Alzheimer's patient. He enters the nursing home after a fall. I should say hospital. He enters a hospital after a fall. He's being discharged to a skilled nursing facility. Okay, so yes, we got a married case here. Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Mr. Jones is ending up in a nursing home. Mrs. Jones asks us about Medicaid eligibility. So now we here's the here's the financial situation. So. They have the house, which in a, in a married case, 
healthy spouse is allowed to keep the house. We're probably going to transfer it over to her. Um, and they have $100,000 even in available resources. And I'm asking you to assume here they have already done their funeral planning and they have already done their car because we're ruling out the need to do the sort of those low hanging fruit things. So we still got a hundred grand. So, and then his income is 1200 bucks. Her income is 450. So with no planning, uh, this family <coughs> will lose 42,000 because from the 100, she's allowed to keep half up to 128, but because it was only a hundred grand to begin with, she's allowed to keep $50,000. She's allowed to keep that house, the car. She's allowed to keep her income. She may be allowed, she is in this fact pattern allowed to keep some of his income. He can keep $8,000. So if we had a hundred, she's allowed to keep 50. He's allowed to keep eight. This family is about to spend $42,000. So if they came to see us, what might we recommend? Well, there's this, um, and here's sort of the overview for that. Um, now, they come in to see us, and we're, they're going to go through forty two grand. and in the console, uh, we find out that this house is subject to a mortgage. All right, so um, maybe it's a younger family or maybe some bank gave them a, a mortgage way too late in life or whatever, but there's still $1,000 a month mortgage payment on that. Now, what's the result? Now, that, that changes things because when we calculate how much of his income that she would be allowed to keep, it factors in their expenses. So here we've got an increased expense, and this is, a, this is sort of like one of these nuances where she has high expenses. So now what's the result? Well, <clears throat> the way the math works here is because they had that high expense, the mortgage, she'd be allowed to keep her income, and she's allowed to keep his income, all of it in this situation. And in fact, had he had more income, she'd be allowed to keep that too because her high monthly expenses, her expenses were that high where like he, he has $1,250 in income, but the way the formula would have worked out, even if he had say $1,700 of income, she'd be allowed to keep that too, but he doesn't, okay? And because he doesn't have that high of income, we can actually exempt additional assets. So we can go to Medicaid and say, look, uh, Mrs. Caseworker, the, this family dynamic is they've got high monthly expenses and his income doesn't cover it. So she's getting all of his income and would be allowed to keep more, but he doesn't have it. So because he doesn't have it, we can ad exempt additional assets. Uh, so uh, the net uh, effect here is this family was eligible for Medicaid the day they went in, even though at first glance it didn't look like it, okay? In this situation, she would be allowed to keep the entire $42,000 they, they were about to spend on care because the state will allow you to exempt additional assets when the income is real low and the expenses are real high, all right? Now, you're never going to figure this out. You don't have the formulas in front of you, and, and it's complicated stuff. But this is why, like, when we work with nursing home partners, and a lot of nursing homes will send us work, we tell them, don't, don't advise this family to go out and buy a funeral account or a car every time because sometimes we find out when we actually get into the nuances and do the math, they didn't have a spend down to do to begin with. They were eligible to begin with um, because of the income situation. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of billing offices will look at the asset statement and they'll see $100,000 and say, you're only allowed to keep 50 because they don't know this sort of second level of planning. And then the families go out and buy a car they don't need or they'll buy more funeral arrangements than they really need. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's just it was a mistake. Now, the person becomes eligible for Medicaid, but they didn't have to go out and buy that new car. Right. So. Um, just you need to you need to know that you need to have your situation kind of looked at. Okay, now I'm going to change it up a little bit. So this is the next example. It's the same family. However, at this consultation, there is no high mortgage. Okay, so we're taking out that that exclusion, that little uh, exception to the rules, and now we're we're saying we got a problem, right? So we're back to having the forty two thousand dollars because we don't get to exempt it now. But here, so if if this family does nothing else. They're going to spend 42 grand over probably three and a half months, and that money is gone forever. And you know, this healthy spouse may live another 10, 15 years, but she's going to be she's going to do it broke. Uh, instead, there is in the law right now this device called a Medicaid qualified annuity. Um, and I'll give you an example here where we take the money and we buy an annuity. Now I don't sell the annuity, I don't make money on the annuities, uh, but 
here, here's, here's the deal. Um, if you buy the right type of an annuity. Now, an annuity, there's a lot of types of annuity. One is a deferred annuity, which is I give an insurance company money. They keep the money for a defined period of time, like five years, seven years, and then later I get my money back with some interest. Okay. Or there's what's called an immediate annuity. With an immediate annuity, I give the insurance company money, and they start giving me my money back next month. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like buying a pension, right? Um, you know, you think of a pension as a monthly check. Well, I'm, I'm sort of giving them my money and they're giving it back. So a simple example here would be, what if I gave them the $42,000 I was about to spend on care? If I gave that and bought a, a Medicaid qualifying annuity, which is a type of immediate annuity, but not every immediate annuity counts. You gotta be working with folks that know what they're doing. I could give the insurance company the money. Uh, the insurance company could pay mom $42,000 uh, a month for 42 months. Now, we might not stretch it out that long, but the point is we're, we're taking an asset and we're then putting it into a Medicaid qualifying annuity that now pays mom the money, okay? And in doing so, we've converted what Medicaid counts as an asset into what Medicaid counts as an income. And now they have to count it as income and we bought it in the healthy spouse's name because the healthy spouse's income doesn't count for Medicaid eligibility for the sick spouse. So we took assets we were about to lose, $42,000. We converted it into a 42 month income stream for mom to bump her monthly cash flow and she's allowed to keep it. Many, many, many families miss this opportunity to protect money for the healthy spouse. We've got great case law in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, you throw the, I, from my standpoint, I throw this type of video out there in the world. I'm not sure if you're watching this years from now, I'm not sure this still works. This is something that, that could end. But as I'm recording this, this is a technique that in a married case, we can use it to protect serious funds for that healthy spouse to make sure that if dad has that stroke, mom's okay. You need to know that this exists. If you are in a situation with a married couple, give us a shot. Let us analyze your case. Let us figure out if we can do this because we might be able to save some real dollars for the healthy spouse here. Um, all right, let's do a, uh, another example. So now this is gonna be a single person. So here comes Mr. Thomas, he's a single person. He's got this house, he's got $150,000 in the bank. Um, so there's his income, he's got a little bit higher income. Now in this case, because he's single, he stands to lose everything. Because even though from an eligibility standpoint, they don't count his house at the, at the outset, they only count the $150,000 of bank assets. When he passes away, the state of Pennsylvania is going to have an estate recovery claim against that house anyhow. So here we have the risk of losing everything. Now, let's say his kid contacts me and his kid is a power of attorney and the power of attorney authorizes us the ability to do some planning. What are we going to do? So in this situation, this is what uh, uh, attorneys call a gift and annuity plan. Here, he's only allowed to keep $2,400. We may give away the house, okay? If the power of attorney authorizes it and it's consistent with dad's desires, we may give away the house, all right? Now, that is intentionally a violation of the five-year look-back period, okay? So we have to disclose that to Medicaid. Medicaid gives us a penalty period, right? So if the house was $150,000, they divide that by the average monthly cost of a nursing home in Pennsylvania, which might be 10,700 and some change. So let's say that that gives us a 14 month penalty period. Okay. But remember, dad had <coughs> 150 grand in the bank. In this situation, I'm, I'm assuming some very simple facts. It's all cash, there aren't nuances with the investments and all the rest, okay? You could take the $150,000 in cash and invest it into a Medicaid qualifying annuity. Now, that annuity would pay for the duration of the penalty period. So let me just walk through the whole scenario. You had 150 grand in cash, you had a $150,000 house. You give away the $150,000 house. That gives us a 14 month penalty period. With the $150,000 in cash, you buy a Medicaid qualifying annuity in an amount sufficient to cover the nursing home bill for the 14 month penalty period. So the gift of the house, the application starts the 14 month penalty period. We're paying through the penalty period with the annuity. At the expiration of the 14 month penalty period, the annuity is over, the penalty period is over. 14 months from now, dad goes on Medicaid and we were able to protect his house. 
because we gave it away, we did the penalty period, we served our time, so to speak, and 14 months later, the penalty period is over, the annuity is over, and dad's eligible for Medicaid. Again, this is complicated stuff, but it can work to protect 50, 60% of the assets for a single person, even after they're in the nursing home, if we've got the legal authority to do it. We need a good power of attorney. We need to know that this is consistent with dad's goals and desires. We need to have enough muscle in that power of attorney to be able to give away assets. We need the family to be getting along. Like there's all kinds of these stars that need to align. But I've given you three cases here. One where we protect about half of the assets from the single case. Another where we did even better than that by buying a Medicaid annuity in the spousal case. And a third where we didn't even have to buy a spousal annuity because we just knew the math and got it right when we were able to exempt additional assets. That was the first one. So what are you supposed to take away from all of this? Are you supposed to be able to go out and do this on your own? No, no, you're not supposed to do this on your own. I've been trying to make that point this entire talk. This is complicated stuff. If you got halfway into this, you might not even realize that whatever strategy you're going down is the wrong idea. Uh, you need to work with an elder law attorney. This is just education material because what I want the viewers to take away is that you have options. Don't freeze. Don't panic. Go see an elder law attorney. Come see us, go see another certified elder law attorney, but go see somebody. Here's some Medicaid mistakes. Uh, misunderstanding the difference between a look back period and a penalty period, um, failing to, uh, applying at the wrong time, like, oh, uh, when I see families, they'll, they'll make a gift to the house and then they'll apply for Medicaid in month 59. All they had to do was make it another month to get past the five year uh, Medicaid clock. Uh, failing to plan with the house, getting the house to the healthy spouse, <clears throat> missing opportunities. Um, Non-attorney planners is a problem. It's becoming uh, more of a problem in Pennsylvania. This stuff is incredibly complicated. And unfortunately, there's these people out there in the world that are calling themselves Medicaid planners who are not lawyers. And they're going around and they're telling people they can get them eligible for Medicaid. But in my opinion, in my strong opinion, and the opinion of several other state bar associations is you can't do this without giving legal advice. How could I tell you to transfer houses? How could I tell you uh, that you need a new will or a new power of attorney. How could I do any of that stuff without giving legal advice? But there's these people out there that are telling people about Medicaid and you know, it kind of looks to me like they can't possibly have all of the tools because it would be illegal for them to use all of the tools. You can only, only lawyers can do estate planning. Uh, and so the families they're working with are just simply not getting the whole story. Um, and so be very wary of non-attorney people that are putting themselves out there as Medicaid planners. Um, there's other options here uh, to plan. Like one of the biggest things here, there's a note here about life insurance. One of the biggest challenges going is life insurance because you run into these situations where a family has, say, like a $50,000 uh, cash value policy, but the death benefit's like 100000 right? There's a big difference between the cash value and the death benefit. Well, unfortunately, Medicaid requires you to spend whatever you can get to on care, right? So people will cash out that policy for $50,000, spend it on a nursing home, then the person passes away, and you never got the death benefit because you surrendered the policy. So there's other options that you need to look at there. Um, but these are just some things that I see people uh, screwing up when they're on their own. Um, so if you've been told you're not eligible, You've been told there's nothing you can do within the five-year look-back period. I hope the takeaway from this video is there's, there are options within the five-year look-back period. If you want to protect assets, it's probably not too late to plan. Give my office a call. Um, we uh, will advise anybody in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you're far, far away, we may hook you up with one of our friends. But give us a shout. I'll take a look at your situation to determine if I think that uh, you could benefit from working with a law firm. Um, have this case uh, evaluated by somebody that knows a few things. And then that way you can at least know that you've got uh, the right strategy moving forward. I cannot stress it enough that Medicaid is not a self-help area. Do not do this alone. Work with an attorney, not just any attorney. Work with an attorney that does this full-time um, and not with somebody that dabbles because these rules just change way too frequently. So here's my contact information. Give me a shout, 724 841 one three nine three. Check out the website secularlawfirm.com. Drop me an email info at secularlawfirm.com uh, and say, hey, we need some help. And we will reach out to you. We'll try to analyze your case. We'll usually have like a free consultation with one of my team members on the phone to make sure it's a good fit for you, make sure it's a good fit for us. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk to you about how that works uh, moving forward. Um, 
All right. I think that that about is it. I, uh, I appreciate your attention to this video. I hope you found it real helpful. My biggest takeaway I want you to have is that um, there are uh, some things that you can do to protect assets. Don't freeze. Reach out to somebody that can help. Uh, we're out here. We're doing this every day. Uh, we look forward to meeting you. And, um, and give me a call. 724-841-1393. Have a great day.